Hey, thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Ray Baker. Um, Wondersmith underscore Ray on Twitter, if you are into that sort of thing. Um, I'm really excited to be here. This is my first talk at DEF CON Recon Village. Uh, my talk today is about using OSINT to combat human trafficking and smuggling. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some statistics and then how trafficking has permeated our culture and then we're going to go into a case, a case study, I guess. So I'm not a huge fan of these intro slides, um, but I think it's kind of important to talk about who I am and what I do and then it will make a little more sense why this is uh, such a passion. So I've been in OSINT for about two years now. I work as a senior recon analyst, and I also have the pleasure of being involved in a few nonprofits. And they're very close to my soul. Uh, the first one is OSINT Curious, where we bring OSINT content to the community. Um, we kind of educate on tools and processes and things, um, and just kind of talk about OSINT. Um, the Innocent Lives Foundation, I volunteer there in the fight against child exploitation. And Operation Safe Escape, um, I assist domestic violence victims and help them escape from their abusers using OSINT. Um, additionally, I added on here that I have a deep love for maritime content, and if you follow me, you will find that out very quickly. <laughs> So I think it's kind of good to outline like what we're talking about when we say human trafficking. Um, I think a picture we have of human trafficking is, you know, a, a shady kind of guy tricking a woman or a child into doing something that they don't want to do. Um, but it's not just women and children. Uh, who can be trafficked. So this, this could be anybody, any age, race, um, sex, gender, um, education level, anybody. Uh, there are some groups that are more vulnerable to trafficking and this could be like undocumented workers, um, the LGBT plus community, um, previous domestic or abused victims, um, ethnic minorities, uh, they tend to all be a little more vulnerable, um, people who don't speak English very well or are here on asylum, um, people who can be manipulated through, uh, debt or things like that. So that leads us to why. Why are people trafficked? Um, we know about sexual exploitation and, um, sex trafficking those ones are pretty much talked about everywhere uh, but there are some other reasons and and that's like forcing children to serve as soldiers um, people are forced to commit crimes for criminals um, you could be forced into labor so this could be like domestic servitude or some kind of like farm labor or something forced marriage uh, sometimes even organ removal, which is a thing that I was unaware of until I researched for this. Uh, so how are these people trafficked? You might say, like, there's no way that I would be trafficked. I wouldn't fall for that. But it's really easy once the, these traffickers find your need. Like, maybe you have a substance abuse issue or you have unstable housing, you have no place to live, uh, mental health concerns, maybe, maybe you were offered a job and you're in a lot of debt. So there's a need that they fulfill. Um, and then there, and then there's an ultimatum like you can't leave because now you are in debt with me. Um, so that's that's how people fall into this situation. Um, and, and when I was researching this, I did find some facts that I thought were really interesting that I wanted to outline. In 20, 2021, 
because of the pandemic, there's obviously an increase in commercial exploitation and sex trafficking. And this included CSEM material, which is child sexual exploitation material. So um, it's not really surprising which with a lot of people home and not working. Uh, but what did surprise me is that a portion of the increase was due to people recirculating uh, misinformation on social media. So this was people trying to share things to raise awareness, like they were sharing CSEM material and basically distributing it and re-victimizing again to try and raise awareness. Um, there was that story about children being smuggled inside of furniture that blew up a while ago. And, you know, you laugh about it like that's ridiculous, but it it takes away resources and time from people who are actually trying to, to help. So spreading that misinformation actually causes a lot of, of trouble. So in 2020, there were 9,876 prosecutions in the U.S., 5,271 convictions, and 109,216 victims were identified. Um, so there's kind of a disparity between how many victims were identified and how many were prosecuted and convicted. I think we can do better. <laughs> um, so the idea of trafficking is kind of ingrained in our society and in our culture. And to the point where we might not even realize that it's a trafficking story, we're just kind of used to hearing these things happen. And the one that I always go back to is the story of Pinocchio. And I'm sure most of us have heard Pinocchio, if not seen it. Um, so the story is Pinocchio, he gets uh, abducted by strangers who kind of coerce him into going with him. He gets sold to an abusive puppet master who makes him f be a puppet and perform under duress and threats. And then he escapes, but he gets caught again. And then finally he heads off to this debaucherous pleasure island, um, which you can see in this picture, like all these boys going to this pleasure island. Uh, and this is a pretty typical trafficking story. So you're taking someone out of their surroundings that they're familiar with, you're isolating them, you're forcing them to perform, uh, threatening them, hurting them, and then you're denying their needs. It's like a, it's a cycle. So now that we've kind of uh, covered what human trafficking is, um, I'm gonna go into a fictional scenario. So. 100% fictional, all these pictures are fake, um, not a real story, but the idea is that I want to illustrate kind of how we can use open source intelligence analysis to aid in finding victims of human trafficking. So this story starts um, with a woman named Naomi and she lives in a, an unstable home. She's not really doing well there. Uh, She's reported missing by her job. She left some clues behind that kind of indicated it might be a human trafficking case. So the police have looked into it, they've hit a dead end, and they've run out of resources and they need us to help. So using OSINT, we will figure out how she was lured, um, hopefully find some patterns that will identify her, and then we will find Naomi, if we're lucky. So the story kind of starts with um, grooming. So the police was a were able to provide uh, direct messages from Instagram uh, showing a conversation between Crystal and Naomi. And so Naomi's been having a hard time. She's been posting pictures online and this woman named Crystal has been liking them, giving her support, kind of just talking her through it. Um, I think it's a misconception that grooming is done mostly by men. Um, a lot of trafficking starts with a woman seeking out another woman to bring her into the fold. So if you think like Ghislaine Maxwell kind of situation where it's like a friendlier face up front pulling you in. So this conversation, Crystal's giving Naomi compliments. Um, Naomi says like, I'm broke. It's sad. Um, Crystal's showing her a Gucci purse that this guy named Jay brought her. So she's getting expensive gifts. Um, 
Naomi's probably feeling kind of jealous. And then Crystal says, you know, I know you need work. I have some work for you. You know, I always say you're a model. You look like a model. So my friend Jay can hook you up. Um, he knows this guy who wants, he'll pay for a date. Just a date, nothing weird. Um, just go on the date, you'll get money, and it'll be over. So she seems a little nervous about this. Um, but they continue to talk. And over time, Naomi has stopped talking to all her friends. And she becomes completely consumed with this relationship she's formed with uh, Crystal and this guy, Jay. So in this screenshot here, uh, she posts a picture of herself. And Jay posts, oh, I, you know, I told you you could be a model. So he's now grooming her. Um, it's classic, you know, find the need, build rapport, be the one who can solve the problem, but it's a limited time offer. Like, you gotta hook up with this guy now, make some money, because he's gonna be gone and you'll lose the opportunity. So at this point, this is where the meetup between Jay and Naomi gets started. As an OSIN analyst, um, we always look at social media. Um, social media will blow up everybody's um, other social media, all their connections, all their other accounts, who they're talking to. We can find a lot through social media. So we use things like what's my name dot app or name check, things like that to enumerate all of these social media accounts. So we look at Naomi, Crystal and Jay and their connections and then what they're connected to. Um, and it looks like Pornhub, Cash App, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, so these all would be good selectors to, to pivot through to find every account that they own uh, that is available. So if we turn back to Naomi's Instagram, we are shown the last picture that she made. It was a photo of herself. Um, the comments are her boss being worried. Uh, people are noticing her missing. Uh, are you okay? You never showed up last night. Call me. So everyone's worried. We know she's gone. This is the last picture Naomi took. It says Las Vegas, Nevada at the top. And again, as an OSIN analyst, we could look at EXIF data, which is data that is um, put into pictures. When you take a picture, there's data in green in the picture uh, that tells you the camera make model flash, maybe GPS locations, um, what programs were used, blah, blah, blah. So social media tends to strip that out. Uh, so Instagram does not have exit data. So we can't use that in this case. But if we look closely, we can see a reflection in her glasses. And it kind of looks like a building, I think. But let's reverse it and see. So, okay, flipping this image, we can see a building and we can see it says South Point. Um, it kind of looks like a casino, uh, which would align with the fact that she's in Vegas. So using the Instagram location of Vegas, uh, the reflection in her glasses, the name South Point and Google Maps, we're able to figure out that her uh, approximate last location was here at this South Point uh, hotel and casino and spa. So this is where she was when she took this last photo. I know this scenario probably seems pretty far-fetched uh, until you see news articles like this one. Uh, in this news article, a stalker stalked someone online that they liked, zoomed in on her eyes and found the reflection um, and used Google Street View to find out what station she got off at on her way home. He also watched her, she had YouTube videos up, he watched her YouTube videos and noted the setup of her apartment and which floor she lived on. So he was able to follow her from the station to her house, knowing which level she lived on, and then he ended up assaulting her. So not too crazy, I mean it's crazy, but not out of the question. So at this point, we could send information to law enforcement, which would be good. Um, they could potentially pull the casino footage, uh, track her phone. She has a Verizon phone. Um, we just know that. <laughs> so according to the retention records um, for Verizon, they can provide the range to tower data for seven to 10 days. 
and they can provide live pings um, for about 400 bucks. So they could potentially find her here. So now that we've logged her last location, we've enumerated her social media. Along the way, we found this website. So it's fake.net and it's an escort site, obviously, um, and it has her image on it. So we're going to dig a little bit into this site. Normally we would note things like servers, uh, IP addresses, numbers, subdomains, things like that, because we would want to pass that on to law enforcement. But this, it was not very too deep. We found uh, a registrant listed. His name is Tiberio Bulat. Bonus points if you know who that is. Um, and the organization is listed as Escorts International. Super transparent guy owns an escort company. So again, we could provide law enforcement with domains, emails, names, uh, subdomains, things like that, and they could try and maybe shut down the website and prevent other people from being trafficked through the site. Um, it's good to keep, keep law enforcement involved, so this is a touch point area. So back to social media, because it is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, we are going to look at the registrant and see what we can find on his social media. Um, so we follow Mr. Bulat and we can see how he's connected to fake.net. Um, Jay, Crystal, Naomi. Uh, we see he's also connected to a guy named Piotr Bulat, who owns a company called Bulat Trucking. So that is something we note down. Also connected to fake.net is Victor Small. So Victor Small has an account for Cash App, and he has an account for Kick. So blowing this out a little bit, we can see Victor Small and his Kick account here, which has a profile image. And the profile image, if you blow it up and you reverse it, it's a Rotterdam sports team. So that's of note that would indicate that he probably lives near Rotterdam um, or is at least from Rotterdam. So his kick account username is smalls underscore Vic. Um, and what's interesting when we ran, because what we do is we go through each username. If there's a username, we try it everywhere to see if maybe they're reusing the username because that, that's a thing people do. So we search this username and it pops on the dark web. So this guy's not very smart. He uses e usernames across accounts um, outside and inside. And we find an interesting conversation. So this is a conversation we found between uh, Victor and two other people. And this is on a dark web forum. So it's a bunch of people talking about how they hate women. Um, we're talking about a video of, I don't know, abuse or something. And um, the Victor Small says, you know, you think this video is crazy. My cousin and I literally bring shiploads of people over here in containers. So let me know if you want one and I'll hook you up. Keep an eye out for the good old Iron Spire. So I'm not really sure what that means yet, but he mentioned shipping containers and iron spire. So this guy is like, no, I don't believe you. Um, and he says, so the trick is to have them sealed up in the container at the port so no one will open it and no one will look. It will go across the ocean to the other side and then it will get dumped onto a truck. So poor Victor Small has told us potentially the entire... Uh, back end of this escort company and human trafficking organization. I'm um, hoping the Iron Spire makes sense soon. <clears throat> so we're going to pivot back quickly to the escort site. So while we were on the escort site, just log all that other information in your report. Um, going back to the escort site, uh, we see that there is another picture under her account and this picture is of a hotel room and she's on the bed it's obviously you know trying to solicit business on this site so 
we know social media strips out exit data, but if you take a picture and you put it straight up on the web, it does not always strip out exit data. So this picture, luckily enough, when we look at the properties, it doesn't have the camera, it doesn't have, you know, the brightness and all that, but what it does have is a GPS location, and that's super interesting. So at this point, I would note down the latitude and longitude and this photo, and I would drop in the latitude and longitude into Google. And when I do, it shows us 500 West 4th Street, Los Angeles, California, which is very interesting since she was in Nevada, and now she's in Los Angeles. So we know she's traveling. Um, the, the name is blurred out. It's not a very fancy hotel at all, but when we pivot over the, or hover over the little picture thing there, it just gives us the name anyway. So I'm not really sure why it blurs out, but, uh, so we have the hotel that she's in. It's called the All-Star Inn. So now to verify that she is actually in the All-Star Inn and the GPS was not incorrect, uh, we can go to the All-Star Inn Google page or the website and we can look through the photos. And when we look through the photos on Google, we can see the rooms and we end up finding the exact room that she is in. So now we have this picture. We probably could have reversed image searched the picture as well and come across this. But so this verifies that the GPS location in the photo is actually at this hotel where she was at when the photo was taken. And when we look at the location of the All-Star Inn on the map, it is suspiciously close to the LAX Terminal Island, um, which concerns me because uh, Victor was talking about putting her on a container and being by one of the ports that is known for trafficking, um, that is highly of note. So, focusing on the dark web brag post with our new information about her being in LAX versus uh, Las Vegas, we could run a search of the ships in the port. And when we do that, it leads us to a ship that is uh, docked called the Iron Spire. So now this makes sense. Uh, and we look at the destination, it's LAX to Rotterdam. So now that makes sense too. So the story is lining up. Um, he basically leaked all of his information on the dark web, which would probably not happen. Um, so we know Victor's sports team was in Rotterdam. He's probably in Rotterdam working the organization on that side. So now I want to see, I want to see this ship. So I pop over to the, this LAX port cam and you can find these cameras everywhere. You can find them street cams, you can find port cams all over the place. Uh, so this one is a new dock street and we happen to see our ship getting containers loaded onto it. So that's very interesting. Um, and we could find one that says Bulat on the side, something like that. At this point, um, I would let the port authority know or law enforcement. They could probably pull bills of lading for the containers or the shipments. Um, they could pop open the container um, and search it if they needed to. So now we know it's a shipping company and we're going to research that specific ship to find what shipping company they use. And we see that Bulat Trucking has heavy connections to this shipping company. We see um, Bulat Trucks going in and out of the same location over time um, in Rotterdam. So we know based on this location of, in this corporate record of Bulat Trucking in Rotterdam, we see a, a picture of the Bulat Truck. It has a blue front. It has Bulat on the side. Um, just as a little tidbit, organized gangs usually smuggle people in hard-sided trucks, while small-time traffickers use uh, soft-sided trucks. I'm not really sure why, but 
that's interesting to know. Um, so following the connection between Mr. Balot and Peter Balot and Balot Trucking, um, I find a webcam in Rotterdam at the port. So looking at the terminal cam, we watch this, we see our Iron Spire come in while we're watching at the ETA listed on the shipping. Um, we see the truck come in, we see it get unloaded onto a uh, truck. We see this truck drive away, and when we zoom in, we see the blue front. So this is a Bulat truck. Um, we suspect that Naomi and possibly other people are on this truck, uh, potentially more victims. And this is where the port cam was on this map. So now we alert the local authorities in Rotterdam. Um, they're able to rush out, they stop the truck, they free all the victims. Um, these victims had endured days inside of a refrigerator truck packed on top of each other. They probably were hungry and they didn't have anywhere to go to the bathroom. Um, it was probably terrible. Uh, cases are really not this easy. <laughs> um, this was a fictional scenario. Uh, I made all these connections very easy to find. Uh, you probably would have a much harder time tracking uh, these human traffickers in real life. Um, and if you're good at police uniforms, looking at this picture, you've probably realized that this uh, policeman here and these investigators are not from the Netherlands. They're not in Rotterdam. Uh, this photo here, sadly, is not from our fake scenario. This this case is a very real case um, from Essex, where 39 trafficking victims from China were put on a container and uh, sent across the English Channel um, and onto this truck, and none of them made it. So while our fictional scenario, they were rescued, this one, um, unfortunately, 39 people were not. So now that I have thoroughly depressed everyone, and um, I'd like to refocus a little and give you a place to direct your anger and your emotion um, in how to help. So if this has uh, made you mad, if it uh, brought up emotions that you need to deal with, um, or even if you just want to help, um, here are some things you can do. So if you see something, say something, especially if you live in uh, Nevada, if you live in California, if you live in Florida, um, high trafficking areas, definitely keep your eyes out. Know what trafficking looks like, know what victims look like, know what recruitment tactics look like. Um, and you can always call the 24 hour hotline. Um, it's better to be safe than sorry. Uh, another thing you can do is be informed about the goods that you buy. So you don't want to um, support trafficking by purchasing something from the supply chain that is made by uh, trafficked laborers. It's just something to be aware of. Uh, you can always volunteer for anti-trafficking efforts. Um, you know, Operation Safe and Safe doesn't directly uh, work with human trafficking, but we do, I mean, we would support the efforts. Um, there are plenty of organizations that will, and if you don't want to physically uh, volunteer, you can always throw money at these organizations. They, I'm sure they need it. Um, or you could send a letter, meet with um, government, ask uh, for better laws to be enacted. Some countries don't have great laws to um, help victims of human trafficking. And if you're a business, you can always provide skills or a job to survivors of human trafficking um, and give them something to, to hope for and work towards. And finally, if you're, if you're just someone on Twitter with a loud voice, um, use your platform, spread awareness, um, volunteer that way, uh, talk about it. Um, there are plenty of ways to help. Um, I hope my presentation here has done something. I hope it has invoked some kind of emotion in you guys. Um, I hope that you now see like ways that OSINT can be used to assist in these types of cases. 
um, how we can supply things to law enforcement, how we can help. Um, I want to thank you for, for having me today. I was very excited for this talk and I will be in the chat to answer any questions that you may have. Um, thank you again for having me. And um, you can find me on social media at uh, wondersmith underscore Ray.